Welcome to the Canadian Philosophy Show, another edition, and this one promises to be very interesting. Our topic is authenticity in the context of uh, existentialism. I hope I have the topic right. Is that right, you guys? I think so. I would like to uh, let each of our participants briefly introduce themselves. Let's start with uh, Juska. Who are you and uh, what Hello. would you like us to know about you, Juska? Yeah, um, my name is, I go by Juska here. And b basically what I do is I'm just a student at Simon Fraser University studying history. But on my own time, I do a lot of reading, a lot of philosophizing, a lot of writing. And you can catch me on uh, Philosophy Express. That's my YouTube channel. We'll put it in the description box later. But that's basically for me. Okay, thanks, Juska. Tegan, tell us something about yourself. Wow, well, there's so much to tell. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, my, my name's Tegan Marshall. I am a second year philosophy student at Vancouver Island University in, on beautiful Vancouver Island. Okay, thank you. And uh, Nicole, hi. Hi, um, my name is Nicole. Um, I'm a student at Simon Fraser University. I study philosophy and psychology, and I'm in my third year. Okay, thanks, Nicole. So, uh, our topic is authenticity, and uh, as it relates to, uh, or as it's understood by um, by the existentialists. I know we've we've talked about Sartre a lot. Who wants to start us off? Hagen, I know you're very interested in the topic. Oh, yeah. Well, I am the guy who brought up Legacy for the first show that we did together, so right. <laughs> obviously authenticity factors into that. So it's important to understand within the existentialist movement, this is a movement that tries to rediscover, well, what it means to exist, what it means to be a human person. Um in terms of the way we go out in in the way we interact with the world um which is void of the traditional philosophical understanding of a metaphysical connection um M mikey brought up um sartre and sartre begins to sartre is a pretty pr can't talk today pretty popular existentialist. So when we deal with the topic of authenticity, um, it's how do we live true to true? How do we live a true life? How do we live a true existence to ourselves um, and within the world? Um, that's the question we're tackling here. And I'm very interested to hear what my colleagues have to say. Um, as we go on, I'll be approaching it from a primarily Heideggerian perspective of authenticity. Um, and I think it's an important question. Um, that's all I'll add for the moment. I approach authenticity from a perspective of uh, Sartre. I, I believe he was uh, influenced by Heidegger. And the thing that Sartre says that I think is a, a, a premise that underlies uh, his viewpoint of authenticity and, and mine is that uh, the phrase is existence precedes essence. So I'd like to get uh, each of uh, you know your feedback on uh, what that means to you. To me, it means that uh, Something akin to we're born with a blank slate. It's uh, perhaps a, a bit of an overstatement to say that Sartre is claiming a complete tabla rasa, complete blank slate, but I think that's what he's getting at. The idea that we're born and there are many possibilities and we can choose from many possibilities as to where to go with our lives. We're not born into a particular uh, 
uh, cast or uh, slot that, uh, that that's predetermined. So uh, I, I I believe that what Sartre's getting at is that uh, that that gives us freedom. Gives us freedom. We we we're, we're we're sentenced when we're born only to be free. We're condemned to be free. We're not condemned to be uh, uh, any particular um, to to fill any particular role in life. Um, in fact, we're condemned to have to choose which role we play. We play. So, uh, how do you guys understand uh, that? And do you think that's an important concept th that existence precedes essence? And do you, do you agree with that concept? Jump in yeah, here. Well, um, um, I want to uh, wait. Sorry, yeah. do you, can I here? I I just want to give a bit of a disclaimer um, to the way um, Sartre views um, our freedom is that we have freedom within our facticity. So we have complete freedom within the facts of our life. So Sartre doesn't advocate for, that we have complete liberty to do whatever we we want to do. We, ha we can do whatever we want to do within our limitations. So for example, if somebody wants to be in the NBA, but they do not have the physical stature to be able to be in the NBA, but they believe that, but they have, still want to be in the NBA and still strive towards that, that is not being authentic. You have to be able, you have to instead um, create g realistic goals within your facticity, within the facts of your life. So it's, there is like, in a way, you are born with a blank slate, but it's also, but that blank slate is within the limitations that you are born into. So you, if you have like, let's say you're born into a certain social class, right? Like, yes, within that social class, you might have like some difficulties. There are some ways you can, you can, you can overpass your, your limitations, but you still have to work within those limitations. Otherwise you are being inauthentic. Nice. And I think the go ahead little talk that you gave on your limitations uh, really signals why it's important to define what it's important to define what what it means by existence precedes essence. So what what it means by essence is your the meaning of an object or the purpose of an object. So the essence of a gun, we would agree, is to shoot bullets, right? And so what Satra is saying, I, from how I interpret it, is not so much that we have a blank slate in the sense that we literally start at zero, but as, as a human being, we have a certain freedom to not just say that we're going to shoot bullets, right? We don't have a predetermined uh, purpose in our lives. And I think that that's what, what essence means here. And so when you exist, that precedes that purpose. And so it's up to you to figure it out. And you're supposed to work that within the limitations that uh, Nicole had mentioned. So there's really a lot of a lot to unpack here, right? So there's going to be what it means by essence and what it me and how that ties into living authentically. I just wanted to uh, point that out there so that we're on the same page on what it means by existence precedes essence, uh, with respect to uh, blank slate and authenticity. And I think uh, moving on from here, we're going to have a real uh, interesting discussion on just uh, how we can manage the relationship between authenticity and our essence. So, and yeah, go ahead, Tegan. Okay. So one, one thing I'll add, um, to this is it's what I said earlier. It's important to note when, when Sartre says that existence precedes essence is Sartre is the one that says, um, there is no human nature, but the human is something that they create of themselves. Um, there, there is no metaphysical human nature of, you know, say in the traditional Christian metaphysic reality of there was original sin, they fell, and so you're condemned to kind of struggle with that. Sartre, Sartre says we are cast into this world alone we are forlorn we are in despair and we experience anguish 
and there's so much more to say there. But he he does acknowledge that there are common aspects to human existence. And this is also where it's key to, as Nicole pointed out, um, to talk about the importance of individual limitations within within their lives, right? Because that will factor into what they can and cannot do. That's all I wanted to add there very quickly. I wanted to add that uh, uh, considering what Nicole pointed out, that gives both a um, immense freedom to humans. The fact that that we have constraints, but the strain, constraints aren't an excuse not to make choices. If the constraints don't actually take away our, our, our freedom, then we can't use them as an excuse to not make choices. To do that would be fleeing our freedom and that would be inauthentic. So back to the topic of authenticity. Authenticity entails, I believe, according to Sartre, as Nicole pointed out, recognizing the constraints that are placed upon us from the outside, and those cons cons constraints can be anything. They could be what's uh, uh, legal or not. It could be that we're in prison and we're actually constrained by the walls of the prison. It could be that we have physical disabilities or, or, or different physical abilities or even disease or sickness. Maybe we're, we're, we're um, uh, constrained uh, as to what we can do physically. Maybe we can't walk around. Uh, maybe we're bedridden, uh, hopefully only temporarily, but even during those times and even with those constraints, it would be inauthentic to flee our freedom. To use external limitations as an excuse not to find meaning and essence in our lives would be inauthentic. So I'm, I'm definitely seeing a trend here where we're talking about what not, what not to do, right? So what to be aware of the constraints and limitations, right? So what to distance ourselves away from. Now we've hint now I'm hearing hints about what we should align ourselves to, what we should aim for. And I'm hearing uh, words like essence or authenticity or freedom, but what does that entail? Because I think, you know, for the subject for the sake of the subject of this um, episode, living authentically isn't just um, shedding away our the limitations of our constraints, but knowing what to align ourselves to. And I think it's a, if we're going to establish what it means to live authentically, we have to know what we're aiming for. So I want to hear what you guys have to say on that. What is it that we're trying to strive for? Absolutely, I think I think you you hit the nail on the head that Jerusco went into. Uh, we need to define what that is. Uh, based on our philosophical understanding. And so coming at it from my, my Heideggerian understanding, um, Heidegger is definitely one of my primary influencers, uh, to understand that Heidegger and his fundamental work being in time raises the question of what does it mean to be? He raises the question Basically, what does it mean to exist in the first place? And he presents this notion of Dasein as Dasein is the Dasein is existence and is defined by possibility. So to go into this a little further, Dasein is our being our being that reaches out into the world for experience to to um, to grow and develop. Um, Dasein, as I said, reaches for possibility. And so, generally, when we're born, and generally when we are um, born and raised, we are raised in a certain understanding, a certain you know, a certain way, generally, and that will shape, that'll shape the way we think, the way we act, but it's, it's in that, it's in that looking inwardly, and where we examine ourselves, and 
and um, what what brings us fulfillment, um, where we can begin to live authentically, because we're doing a we're doing an internal investigation onto what makes us us. I don't know if that makes any sense, but we'll we'll go with that for a minute. Okay. Well, it makes sense, and you're definitely um trying to you're definitely stated that we have to do some soul searching and some uh, investigation, but I still don't see how that would lead us to what we have to strive for, which which was the problem that I've established, where we know what not to do, which is um, be confined by the limitations. But what are we going for? We know what we're going against, but what are we going for? And I think that's important if we're going to establish what it means to live authentically. Okay, I, I uh, get your point, um, Jiska, and, and, and let's try and move toward that, although I know we're not going to ever get, if, if we're talking about Sartre at least, and probably even Heidegger, we're not going to get to a place where either of those philosophers uh, are going to tell us what specifically we are supposed to do in our lives, because the whole... <laughs> one of the major premises of existentialism is that we find our own meaning, that nobody on the outside, not society, not any individual on the outside, not any um, theorem or, uh, uh, or, or prepackaged model can tell us what to do with our lives. And that precisely is what gives us freedom. The fact that we are both condemned and have the opportunity to find um, essence, to find meaning in our, in our own lives. But that's not to say there aren't some guidelines. So here's here's one guideline um, that Sartre talks about, and he talks about anguish. So anguish um, is a, a feeling that we get when we when we realize the burden of our decisions. In that uh, a decision that I make is a decision for all humanity. So it, it's it's a it's sort of an expression of morality in in, in in Sartre's own way. So since Sartre rejects prepackaged moral codes. Uh, that are a priori or uh, imposed from the outside or that we're born with. Rather, he says that it's just a fact of human, the human condition that, that we are a large community and the decisions that each of us make individually are, are the decisions for all, all humanity. So it's a sort of an abstract concept, but it, but it has a very practical application, which is that if I, uh, uh, I have to consider when I make choices, when I when I when I choose how to behave or how to act or what to do in my life, I am choosing for all of humanity. It's very profound, but but I I, I say that that's at least a partial answer to your question, Juska, because that gives us some guidelines as far as what to choose in our lives when we have this anguish and realize the impact of our decisions. I mean, I, I want to also so. like add into that, like, I want to add in that um, Sartre is definitely like one of the philosoph like existential philosophers that does talk more about like how like our impacts on society and how to improve society, and he was very much so about you know um, getting rid of fasc like anti-fascism and all those things during his time, right? Um, there, but when we talk about the concept of anguish, it is um, it is common amongst all um existentialists to some extent they don't not they don't always use the term anguish but it always comes to mean sort of the same thing um but there's also this um notion of anguish that has to do with you know coming to that realization that we we are responsible for our ourselves we 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 are responsible for making something out of our lives and i am going to point back at an example in Sartre's um, works, but in Nausea, the, the the main protagonist, you know, is just floating through life, you know, not really noticing what the day is passing by. Each day is passing by, and you know, just and then he doesn't really notice it. And then one day he comes to an existential crisis in a in a sense, right? A realization that, wow, what have I been doing all my life? I just realized that, you know. Uh, I uh, like I've been doing nothing, and now I need to change it. And that pr and that feeling of o being overwhelmed and by like by having to create your own meaning and your own authenticity is also 
um, characterized as anguish as well. And what I did want to talk about is how we get to the steps of becoming authentic ourselves. So most of the um, existentialists are kind of there's there's a there's a pattern to like to when you become authentic. Okay, so normally it starts with um, nihilism, right? So so you start with um, well, for, well, before nihilism, you start with kind of being kind of like conformist and living in the world and not really thinking about what you're doing. And then then you become nihilistic, which is you realize the world has no like inherent objective meaning. You know, nobody really cares about you, maybe besides your parents. But, you know, there's no like God that cares about you. You know, like the society doesn't really care about you as a person. Like you, you kind of you kind of recognize that like the world does not have objective morality. And then after that, you know, once you come to that realization of nihilism, then you become, you get that sense of anguish or anxiety, um, that existential dread. That's what comes in. And when you face that existential dread, after like the steps after that, which I can introduce, you know, with Camus, you know, is either you commit physical suicide to get rid of that uncomfortable feeling, um, Philosophical suicide to get rid of that feeling, like or like for example, becoming religious was was because he's you know one of the atheist existentialists. Or the other option for that is to be, become lucid about life, recognize that you know our world is inherently nihilistic, our world is un- inherently meaningless. But you work within that to create your own meaning and to become your own person. And you and you of av- and to be authentic means to avoid conformity, um, work towards to define your own values, make independent decisions and be integ- and, and build integrity to, with your, with your own authentic self. So I think also, there's, um, yeah. Um, from what you said, I think there's a, we can break it down into, like you said, the three stages, right? And I think existentialism in a nutshell is basically um, providing yourself the meaning that you have realized that the world does not provide you. If that makes sense. So you assume that the world provides this meaning and then you kind of go through a, a falling stage when you realize that, that there never was a meaning provided by the world. And then you take it upon yourself to, uh, provide that meaning for yourself, by yourself, for yourself. And I think that's definitely the core of existentialism, no matter who the existentialist is. Uh, anyone from the Satra that we've been talking about, all the way to Nietzsche, right? Nietzsche um, definitely talked about the uh, shedding away of the uh, cultural values um, that you were, uh, that you grew up with, and then um, overcoming the nihilism that um, follows that, and then creating your own meaning. Um, Satra, uh, more or less the same thing, but not exactly. The point is, I think that's definitely what existentialism is all about. The question then remains, is that existentialist model necessarily react to the, the yeah. Okay. Well, um, absence of meaning in the world that I make meaning yourself is it authentic meaning yourself? Yeah. So as to some would say, it's a cope to make meaning for yourself. Because you not say Romanian nihilism is more authentic because that would make it so that uh, you don't feel the need to provide that meaning. So um. Yeah, thanks, uh, Juska. Uh, when you talked about Nietzsche, when you referenced Nietzsche, I, I, I now I'm thinking about Nietzsche. And I know, Nicole, I know you like you like you like Nietzsche, and you like talking about Nietzsche. So let me let me make a, a claim about Nietzsche, and then I'd, I'd love to get your guys' feedback whether you whether you agree or see it the way I do. So um, so Nietzsche wrote um, that God is dead, right? That was a that's a well known phrase um, from 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 Nietzsche. God is dead. So, what does Nietzsche mean by that? So here, I'm, 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 I'm. I understand that to mean not that, uh, not an. It's not an anti-religious claim per se. It's not a uh, 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 dis- 
you know, he doesn't advocate descending into nihilism. But I hear that claim as a, an existentialist claim, as what we now call existentialism, where where we are responsible for our own meaning. That that no longer can we can we um, uh, uh, be inauthentic. No longer can we flee our freedom by simply subscribing to latching on to religious dogma. So God, as I as I understand Nietzsche to be referring to, it does not mean like God literally. It means religion religious dogma from the outside and uh so so yeah, as you just said juska the first reaction might be oh nihilism right I, if 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 religion's out of my life if god's out of my life if, if morality's out of my life and all the things that i've clung on to that have been taught to me by the church if that's out of my life then i descend into nihilism because there's no meaning but then the next step the next step is what Sartre and the other existentialists who came after Nietzsche advocate, which is finding your own meaning. Sartre doesn't advocate nihilism. He doesn't say there's nothing meaningful, that, that life is meaningless and you should just kill yourself. Not at all. Sartre says the opposite, that because religion and prepackaged, externally constructed moralities and ways of life and values are actually fake, and inauthentic, you have complete freedom. And if you are an authentic human being, you will not flee that freedom, but you actually will create your own meaning in the space, in the space that's made when you reject dogma. Nicole, you're uh, the Nietzsche before. expert here. What do you think? What do you think and about the, that? The one thing that I do want to. Oh, well, I, one thing I did want to say is that, you know, Camus definitely says this and all of the other existentialists also hint at this, but, you know, they all, they all say that, you know, life is nihilistic and, you know, ultimately meaningless. The world, you know, like is ultimately meaningless. But even if we live in a meaningless world, it is still best to choose life. And that is the fundamental um, conclusion that these existentialists get to. You know, like the, there are like some, you know, I guess like really pe like pessimistic philosophers who might, you know, who do advocate for like antinatalism and, you know, other things like, you know, like not, ha you know, like, for example, not having babies and just trying to exterminate the human race because, you know, they they do b truly believe that, you know, e the world is meaningless and it isn't isn't best to choose life. Right. Um, I know, not, I don't know the name off the top of my head, but I know there is a philosopher who does um, advocate for antinatalism, but ben and, Attar? but does not. Add, huh? Yeah, oh, sorry. And I I don't know how to pronounce it, but I believe it's Bentar Benatar. Yeah, yeah, like there's the yeah anti yeah. yeah uh, Benatar, I'm an antinatalist you know? myself, so I would know. Yeah, yeah, but they they do advocate for antinatalism, you know, in a sense of like. Uh, eradicating the human race by not having babies but they do also recognize that they, there is um su inherent suffering and you know like committing suicide and you know like a lot of them say you know i don't really want to be here but you know it's worse to c kill yourself than to um than to you know li continue living on but they all add, but they do advocate for antinatalism however it is you need to we need to separate that like like true like pessimistic philosophy from um, existentialism. Ex existentialism is inherently an optimistic philosophy because it does say that even though we do live in a meaningless world, it is still best to choose life. And that is, that is my argument that existentialism is an optimistic philosophy. I agree with you, Nicole. I think existentialism has a bad name in some circles because it's misunderstood because people hear the first part but not the second part. So they hear the rejection of of, um, of a priori um, value systems and morality and a priori directions on how you're supposed to live your lives. Since existentialism directs, um, dismisses those things, rejects those things, people stop there and they say, oh, existentialism is meaningless. It advocates a meaningless life. You might as well kill yourself. In fact, some people even believe that existentialism suggests you kill yourself because there's no meaning. That's so far from the truth. What existentialism does is it opens the door, and you can see this from Nietzsche with the God is Dead, through through you know through Heidegger and, and Sartre and many of the existentialists, they're opening up the field to so many possibilities. In fact, Sartre specifically uses the word possibilities. That 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 because we are free, if we are authentic, we 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 choose, we will choose to live into 
possibilities. The possibilities are endless when you're not constrained by the church or by moral codes or by preconceived notions, socially constructed notions about how you're supposed to live. And that's what is meant by existence precedes essence. So this is all good stuff and I wholeheartedly agree, but I think mm -hmm. we've got can I can I bring up something? There is like a part that of me that oh I want to here you can talk, yeah. is she out? Um, I was gonna say um, if you guys can hear me. Um, yeah, go ahead. The yeah yeah the. The question that I wanted to say before I cut out five minutes ago is, so we were talking about how uh, the second part of existentialist is really finding that meaning, right? Really asserting our um, selves and uh, finding meaning for ourselves. And that is definitely the uh, core philosophy in, in existentialism. But is that, but then the question I have is, is that necessarily authentic? Because it seems to me that by trying to find meaning, you are in a way uh, reacting to the meaninglessness in uh, inherent in the in reality. So it's almost like a reactive cope. Whereas somebody truly uh, nihilistic, but also very okay with the nihilism, uh, really in harmony with the meaninglessness, um, I, I would uh, say that that is more authentic. And if that person could. Um, fight to uh, find meaning for its own sake out of um, out of the joy of doing it rather than to react to the meaninglessness I, I would argue that that is way more authentic than somebody who um, finds uh, meaning in response to the meaninglessness uh, that's uh, no longer provided by the world if that makes sense hmm well what if uh what if I reject it all external meaning? I wake up in the morning. So let's be very practical about this. I wake up in the morning and I've rejected everything that I've been taught and everything I thought to be true. And I say to myself, I'm completely free. What do I want to do? Oh, good. Now I can just sit around and drink beer and watch TV and I don't have any more responsibilities. <laughs> is that what Sartre is talking about is freedom? Would, would that be authentic? No, no. I, I know that. I know that. So well, the question is, what you just said, the example of the uh, alcoholic there, isn't necessarily what's uh, advocated by the existentialist. But I'm saying that can there not be a difference, a divide between what's existentialist and what's authentic? Because it seems to me that even though that alcoholic analogy that you gave, even though it's not something advocated by the existentialist, it can also be argued as authentic. If it gives me meaning... So because I, my, yeah. the, the core idea that I want to say here is that if you're trying to find meaning as a reaction to the meaninglessness, then you are coping and it's not technically authentic. Mm -hmm. If it's coping rather than choosing. Yeah, because you're co because um, as as you as you guys have established the existentialist uh, one, two, three process of um meaning from the world, realizing that, that there never was meaning, and then creating meaning for yourself, that is uh, reactive coping. That's, you, you don't, you can't, it seems like a lot of these existentialists that they're trying to find the meaning because they cannot bear the meaninglessness. However, if you could, if you could bear the meaninglessness and then do what the existentialists would have done anyways, out of its own sake, then I would argue that is authentic, right? Can you give an example of like of like just living with a meaninglessness, but still doing what the sure, existentialist? Sure. I, I could I could give a okay. Yeah. So um, let's say that um, stage one we have the alcoholic, right? Or so that's stage two actually. So stage one he found meaning in um, in whatever in X, and then stage two. Uh, he's, he realized that that never was, and so he becomes an alcoholic. Now, let us say that he reads an existentialist article or whatever, and then proceeds to find meaning. Now, I would argue that that's not really 
authentic. It is existentialist, but it's not authentic to go find meaning because you are in reacting to the fact that you cannot bear um, being an alcoholic. However, if you say that, hey, you know what? Um, I'm just going to go find meaning for its own sake because it seems like a fun thing to do. That's authentic because then you are proactive in finding meaning, but you are not reactive in trying to escape the meaninglessness. So in both scenarios, you are doing the same thing. However, they, they are founded upon different uh, reasons. In the existentialist, but the not, no, existentialist, not authentic one, you are trying to um, exist and you are trying to cope from the meaninglessness. In the authentic one, uh, whether you are an alcoholic and doing nothing or you're doing something, you're doing it for its own sake. And I think that's way more authentic, even though no matter how far it diverges from existentialist ideas. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, I think that is really, I never really heard of anybody put it that way before. And I think that's, that's a really interesting, you know, like um, consideration. Um, but what I do know about existentialists and existentialism is that the pattern is um, that people face that anguish or anxiety and they seek um, for authenticity and for meaning because they want to escape that uncomfortable meaning. That is something that is explicitly um, mentioned in, I would say most like existential yeah, philosophy. Definitely. But what you did bring up is interesting about how seeking meaning for its own sake could be more authentic than if you're seeking meaning to get rid of that uncomfortable feeling of not having meaning. Yeah, exactly. Um, one of my favorite films um, I talk about a lot with, among my friends is uh, No Country for Old Men. And in the in the movie, uh, spoiler alert for those, I, I won't spoil it, but basically we follow this protagonist who um, just basically follows, a, follows a, he steals a briefcase full of, full of money and then um, he gets uh, hunted down by a hitman. Now, I, I did a video on this in my channel, but I basically stated that um, the fact that he just did it out of its own sake is something that's truly existentialist. It is truly authentic in the sense that he's not doing it in response to anything. He's just doing it just because. Whereas um, the local sheriff, he's very, um, he's, he's in what we uh, established as stage two which is, you know, he's very uh, depressed because um, the meaning that he had sought existed is crumbling down. Traditions are crumbling down. Uh, morality is crumbling down. Everything's crumbling down. And so he's in stage two. And now he's all gloomy and do doomy. And it, in the video that I did, you can, it's the most popular video on my channel, but you can check it out there. I basically stated that um, the protagonist even though things were coming down around him, he just uh, went on with, he just um, ran with the money for its own sake. And I think that's uh, something very uh, authentic, very noble. Um, whereas um, existentialism in the traditional sense is, to me, something that's, it's, it's, it's you know, um, Camus, uh, he, he actually, believe it or not, Albert Camus never really uh, liked to be considered a philosopher. And I think there, there's many interpretations as to why that is the case. But I think the reason why he did not want to be considered a philosopher is because he viewed philosophy as another uh, way to deal with the absurdity of reality. So he talked about people who um, try to uh, find meaning in religion. He, tried to, uh, he says that uh, philosophy is just another religion that people try to find meaning in. And it, I, I think in that respect, like existentialism is one of those ways where we try to find meaning, but it's not, and therefore it's not uh, uh, truly authentic because we are just trying to go there to seek some uh, uh, comfort. Tegan, did you want to uh, get yeah, a word in here? Oh boy, do I ever. Mm -hmm. okay. so You're a little bit talk. soft there. Your audio is soft. I don't know if you can speak up a little bit. So there's a couple things. Is that any better? Go ahead. 
So there's a couple things at play here. First of all, as much as your notion Juska is intriguing, it's not possible. It's not possible because in a sense you would have to do you would have to undermine human experience. You would have to undermine human emotional response. Which isn't going to happen. It, but it is an interesting theory and I would want to look more at it. What, what I would say is, is the following. We've covered a lot of ground here from God is dead to <laughs> existence. We're kind of a bit off track. Here. And, and I guess I would, I would put it this way. We see a trend for the existentialist, for the human person, that even as Sartre says, we are, and I'm paraphrasing, so uh, don't get mad at me, but we are thrust into a world and we must journey through it to find purpose. There is, there is this, there is right from the outset, there is a realization that takes place. And this is where Heidegger would talk about his notion of the they, right? The authentic person is no longer part of the they. What is the they? The they is general society and general understanding. Heidegger says, though, in order to experience freedom, in order to discover being, in order to be free, you must first come to knowledge of the they. So it goes back to my point earlier that the families we're raised in, the situations we grow up around, shape us. But to understand and then eventually come to the realization that, oh, what I've experienced up to this point does not bring me true fulfillment, does not bring me um, tr true happiness or flourishing, as Aristotle would put it. Um, you need, you need a starting base. So to, to state that you must first, to state that you can deal with this in-between of, of just embracing the in-between, that's, I don't think Heidegger would say, and I don't think many philosophers would say, that that is what you, that is not, that is not your full potential. And, and by doing so, you're actually holding yourself back from the very, the joys and the sorrows of human existence. What, what do you guys think about that? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I, uh, I think um, I think what Sartre is saying, at least, is that um, you've got to wipe the plate clean before you can start afresh. And 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 uh, Juska, I know this is related to what you're saying, but uh, but uh, Sartre talks uh, talks about forlornness. So forlornness uh, is defined by Sartre as an awareness that I am free and there's no morality to save me. So. Uh, that's the first part of his definition of forlornness, and that's what we've been talking about, which is the, the God is dead part. When you reject what you thought to be true, what you re what, when you reject what society tells you, what your teachers tell you uh, are a priori truths or religious doctrines or morality, when you reject that, you, you appear to be in sort of a nihilistic place. But that's where the plate is wiped clean. And now the second part of the definition of, of forlornness is that now if you're going to be authentic, and we, that's, we're going back to where we started the conversation. This is our topic, authenticity. According to Sartre, this is where auth authenticity comes into play, which is you don't just sit there in nihilism. You don't sit there and say, oh, there's no meaning. Forget it. I might as well become an alcoholic or I might as well kill myself or just waste my life. If That would be fleeing. That would be inauthentic. So authenticity is 
using the opportunity when you've rejected the training wheels, if you can call call those things training wheels, when you reject those things and say, now it's time to grow up and be a full-fledged human being and live into possibilities. Choose my own meaning in life, not to remain in, in nihilism. So I, I'm not sure I see it the way, the way that you do, Juska, because I see a reaction to the understanding that there actually is no meaning. There is no essence which precedes my existence. The reaction to that, I, I would argue, and I think Sartre would argue, is precisely what gives authenticity to, one, to one's life. What makes your life authentic is the realization that there is nothing more than what you create in your life. And it's a reaction, I would say, maybe contrary to what your argument was, Juska, it's a reaction to the nothingness. The reaction to the nothingness is what creates authenticity. And you can't have authenticity so long as you cling on to beliefs about essence preceding existence. You need to understand that existence precedes essence. And then only when you understand that, only when you understand meaninglessness, can you understand meaning. It's sort of like you, there can't be a valley without a mountain. There can't be meaning without meaninglessness. And so what Sartre is teaching us is you have to first accept meaninglessness. You have to accept the meaninglessness of all the stuff that we've been taught, all the stuff that society has told us is the truth or that the church has told us with the truth. When you, re when you accept that God is dead, then as a reaction to that, you now have the possibility of being an authentic human being and, cre and finding your own meaning, whatever that be, creating your own essence, whether that be getting a you know degree in philosophy or whether that be becoming a teacher or uh, being an artist or a filmmaker whatever that essence is that you choose that's authentic when you pursue that but it, that can only happen when you realize that there's nothing else is that contrary to your position juska um yeah so i think we we really have to uh, they call it separate we from the chaff or something. Uh, I think we really have to firmly define where we agree and where we disagree. Because mm -hmm. half of what you, because you, you, I get the sense that you, you said everything that you said as contrary to what I said. But in reality, like more than half of that is something that I'm firmly on board on. Okay. So, yeah, we talk about the meaninglessness and accepting the meaninglessness. I am totally on board with that. I think whether it's purely existential, whether it's purely authentic, assuming that they're different, I think that is the first step fundamental in going about that way. Right? So you have to accept the meaninglessness. Mm -hmm. However, I get the sense that you are saying that it is the reaction to the meaninglessness that gives you authenticity. Right? It's truly understanding the meaninglessness and... Um, responding to that and say hey you know what you might it might be meaninglessness but i'm still gonna make that meaning for myself and i get the sense that your argument is that that's what makes us authentic can i whereas i stand us. is whereas i stand is mm -hmm. i am more proactive so even though we both agree that we have to accept the meaninglessness even though we both agree that we have to um know what it's like to understand that there is no external sources of meaning um there is no difference for me uh in, in the context of authenticity to be completely nowadays or to be uh or to have your own essence for its own sake but i would argue that it is better to be completely nowadays and to be committed to that rather than to um find meaning as a reaction so everything we see is um is um i do i we agree 100 percent on the accepting the meaninglessness. The only difference that we have is you are saying we have to react, and I'm saying we have to be proactive. We cannot we cannot respond to the meaninglessness. We have to completely um, um, get rid of that. It shouldn't even be a factor in the way we live our lives. But how can you be committed to meaninglessness? Because commitment is meaning. You know, I mean, by commitment to meaning, I don't mean uh, you have to fully uh, dedicate yourself to that then yes you you would uh find meaning in the meaninglessness what i'm saying is uh, you don't 
you have to uh, be okay with it, acceptance. And acceptance isn't necessarily a uh, um, positive thing. And by positive, I mean additive, right? If it's additive, then you are trying to find meaning in the meaninglessness. But it can be a passive thing. If, 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 you're, not str- if you're simply not um, trying to struggle against the meaninglessness, you are accepting it without uh, finding meaning in it. And I think that's, um, in, in my in, in my channel, I've mentioned the word uh, meta harmony. That's what I call it. There, there's probably different ways that different people call it, but um, meta harmony is when you just passively ex- embrace and accept uh, something, whatever it is, be it a meaninglessness or something else. And you could do that, and I would say that's authentic. You could also um, fully embrace the fact that you're not going to accept it, and you're going to proactively uh, try to find meaning, and that's authentic too. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, okay, can I Mikey ask does... something? Sure. Just, just in relation to like Juska's point, and I actually, I sympathize with what Juska was saying earlier about, you know, um, the, there possibly being a difference between choosing to look for your, being be authentic and choosing to have your own meaning because you want to do it on your own accord versus because existentialism says so. And I wanted to ask, you know, anybody really can say this, but what makes existentialism and even philosophy in general immune from becoming a God surrogate, which is a term used, you know, for people who choose to go towards, you know, a philos- let's say philosophical suicide to avoid, you know, the, the anguish that they're feeling from not having meaning. So like what, what makes existentialism and even philosophy in a greater scale immune from that and is it even immune from being that and i thought that was an interesting consideration yeah um that's a great question because uh, it's, it's a very easy trap to fall into right um you you reject you reject something and then you look towards something else but that becomes a surrogate for the thing that you reject in the first place i think the uh it's not a simple answer and it's easier said than done but I think the way, and I've been thinking about this a long time. What you're supposed to do is, if you're, if you are, it's, if you are going to uh, look at it as a, sh- a surrogate, the key is to fully accept the fact that it's never gonna, um, re- it's never gonna fulfill the meaning that you're going to crave, and you are going to have to embrace the shortcomings of that surrogate. And then when you embrace it, and when you fully harness it. And when you f- fully harness the fact that it's a shortcoming, then you make it something that's your own. And then you are, then you have escaped the fate of looking at it like a God surrogate. So to give it a more practical um, example, let's say that um, I believe in the calculator God, okay? There is a God and his name is calculator. And, and then I reject it and I feel meaningless, okay? And then it's like, oh, it just so happens that there's a calculator right in front of me. And then if I look at this calculator as a surrogate for the calculator deity, then I am not, I fell into the trap that you were talking about. However, if I fully embrace the fact that this will never add up to the meaning that I seek to fulfill, and I use that and I harness that pain and sorrow to make something to benefit myself, that's the key here then you're taking it to your advantage to your interest and then you have um transcended beyond the needing for the fulfillment do you do you see what i mean so it's it's kind of um people just say in simple terms uh turning lemons to lemonade thanks Drew. i'm going to respond also to your argument um nicole so uh i I think the argument that you're suggesting, Nicole, is similar to the um, claim that some people make, um, contemporary claim that humanism is another religion. So, because uh, I, what I heard you say is that, well, philosophy or, or the existentialist philosophy is simply another religion. So, so if you were to take Nietzsche's um, words and say, okay, God is dead. And so now you're in a place of nihilism temporarily. Then you say, now what can I put in that place? Oh, I'll construct a philosophy of existentialism as a way of finding meaning. Then you're just reconstructing God, right? I think that's what you were suggesting in another form. 
But I, I reject that argument because I think it neglects to look at the content of the belief. So, I mean, we don't have the, it's off topic now, but if you look at the content of humanism, what humanism teaches, what the values of humanism are, I think they're quite different in kind than religious values. So to ignore the content and just say, oh, well, humanism is just another religion, I think that's incorrect. And I, and I, think, th I think the same thing applies to what we're talking about here. I think there's a difference in content, relevant content, between existentialist philosophy and religious dogma. That that if you look at the content, it would be justifiable to say that um, that that existentialist philosophy is actually quite different in kind than um, than the religion or, or the morality that it rejects. And I think we come down to. All acts are interpreted. So, to to look at to look at philosophy. Philosophy, the word means the love of wisdom. So to pursue wisdom. That doesn't necessarily mean you're pursuing it. You know, and I'm sure we all agree on this. As a as a god, you strive towards. That. But it is more something that you reach out towards and you absorb and you take in and you cross. Um, I think, as my fellow co hosts have stated, there is that possibility. But it's up to you, the individual, to, to make the decisions on what you accept and you reject versus. versus um, an organized form which is you must accept this and this and this and you can only reject this this and this now where it becomes interesting and this is a whole nother topic but is where religion and philosophy intertwine so anyway um, I think I think yeah there, there is a certain level of concern but to go back to why we study philosophy in the first place it is to learn, it is to become aware, it is to, it is to engage with material in a meaningful manner um, to grow and develop. So I think, yeah. Okay, thanks, Tegan. Um, we only have a couple of minutes, you guys, so I thought maybe we could end with uh, each of us, if we choose, uh, just give a brief uh, couple sentences on uh, on our conclusion after this discussion of what 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 is authenticity. Um, so I'll start. So uh, I'm concluding that authentic authenticity um, necessarily includes a uh, 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 taking responsibility for the meaning in one's own life rather than using uh, external. Um, dogma, including religious dogma, um, as a uh, as a crutch. Um, so, so I'm taking I'm taking Sartre's position that auth authenticity entails a rejection of uh, of uh, externally imposed meaning um, uh, and uh, having taking responsibility for for complete freedom. What about uh, you, Jusko? What's your what's your final word on authenticity? I believe um, authenticity bottom line at the f core foundation is um, embracing whatever you choose to adhere to. So whether it's external sources or internal sources, if you fully embrace it and uh, acknowledge their own strengths and uh, weaknesses and use it for your own advantage, uh, that's to me is authenticity. It doesn't, you don't have to negate anything. You don't have to uh, build anything. It's whatever you decide to do negation or building uh, you have to be fully uh, you have to fully embrace it and that that to me is authenticity mm, thanks Jessica and uh, take and what's your final word then from from the realization that you are the only person that can determine value and, and meaning also requires you to then reshape your world and, and what you perceive to pursue the things you're passionate about that, that, that make you happy um, is, is part of the process, whether that is in the context of a community and then becoming aware, or you're just fundamentally aware from the beginning. Either way, it's a journey of discovery to live authentically. 
Thanks, Tegan. And Nicole, you have the last word today. Great. Um, so I think um, with authenticity, we can allude to Socrates when he said that the unexamined life is not worth living. And the unexamined life is where we fall to conformity and we let other people decide um, what we are, um, what we should, what we should do. And being authentic is it, having an examined life and being uh, deliberate in what we choose to do and going towards and building ourselves and our values. Okay, thank you, Nicole Kerrigan, Juska, Tegan Marshall. I'm Michael Robert Kaditz. Thank you for listening to the Canadian Philosophy Show.